All right, good morning to all of you, even as we begin a new semester. Um, so we will be covering doctrinal foundations this semester. Um, now, we will be looking at all the main doctrines which are covered in the Bible. We will be looking at what the Bible has to say on each of these fund fundamental uh, beliefs that we hold on to as believers. And uh, you know the course title says Doctrinal Foundations, because these are the foundations on which we build our Christian faith and our Christian walk. Um, if we are not very sure of what we believe and why we believe those things, we may get shaken in our faith in our Christian walk. But then if we are very sure about what the Bible says on these fundamental topics and um, we hold on to those truths, we are able to build ourselves in our spiritual walk. So these are foundational doctrines and we need them uh, to have a strong walk in God. All right. So uh, we will be looking at various different doctrines. Uh, we will begin with the doctrine of the word of God. Uh, we will take this class and also maybe next week. Uh, so we will devote two weeks for the doctrine of the word of God. And after that, we will move into uh, various other doctrines. So to get started with the doctrine of the word of God, uh, there are some very brief notes available um, for those who are uh, attending through Google Classroom. Uh, it has been posted in the Google Classroom. The notes have been posted. Uh, so, uh, if you were to look in those notes, uh, the first thing that's mentioned over there in your notes is that when we say doctrine of word of God, that term word of God can mean many things actually, uh, four, four different things in fact. Um, if we could have any one person read out Genesis chapter 2 verse 16, Genesis chapter 2 verse 16, if anyone um, could read out for us, please, either here in the class or even online. Two sixteen. Okay. Genesis chapter two, verse sixteen. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat." Um, seventeen as well. <laughs> okay. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now over here it says the Lord God commanded the man. Now this is a commandment. It's a word of the Lord being given. And it's being given directly by God to the humans. Uh, it's not being given through a prophet. It's not being given through a messenger. So here the word of God is being directly communicated to humans. So this is one way uh, of looking at the word of God, where God directly speaks to a person and conveys something. A second way that uh, we can look at the term word of God, that would be in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. So if we can have someone read out for us, Deuteronomy 18, 18. Uh, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So here the Lord is saying, I will put my words in his mouth. Here, of course, he's referring to Moses. So the Lord says, I'll put my words in his mouth and he will tell the Israelites everything that I have commanded. So in the first instance, we see God directly giving his word to Adam and Eve, uh, not through a messenger. Here we see that the communication is being made through Moses. Uh, so, this, so the word of God can come directly to people. It can come through a messenger. The third 
you know manner in which the term word of god is used in the bible that would be john 1 1 which we are very familiar with if we can have any one person read out for us john 1 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god now here we see that the word of god uh, is not the spoken word which is being talked about here the word of god is referring to an actual person so the person jesus christ himself is also being described as the word of god so the word of god can be the spoken word the word of god can also be the very person of god uh, in the form of jesus christ and then we have the fourth form in which the word of god is used the one uh, which we would be focusing upon you know in our um, class today that would be exodus 31 18 exodus 31 verse 18 Exodus chapter thirteen was eighteen. Thirty one was eighteen. Thirty one was eighteen. Yeah. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tab two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Now here the word of God is not being spoken. Here the word of God is not being presented as a person. but rather here you see the word of god being written down and in this particular instance in fact god himself is directly writing down those words it's not a human who is writing down those words even as god is dictating rather god himself is directly writing down the words which he wishes to convey to his people uh, uh but usually the word of god was written down by people even as the lord spoke to them and asked them to write it down maybe we will look at one verse which talks about that as well uh, so deuteronomy 31 verse 9 so if someone could read out for us deuteronomy 31 verse 9 so moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests the sons of levi who bore the ark of the covenant of the lord and to all the elders of israel and so over here we don't see these laws being written down directly by the finger of god rather here uh, in deuteronomy 31 verse 9 we see a human being writing down the words but then they are not the human's words they are god's words which are being written down just as even you know just as commanded by the lord so these are the different ways in which we see the word of god being presented to us in the bible um and whichever form this word of god is being presented in it is fully authoritative it is absolutely true and perfect so sometimes it may be a spoken word sometimes it may be a written word and sometimes it is literally in the form of jesus christ but in whatever way the word of god is presented it's uh, it's to be you know accepted that it's absolutely authoritative and it is absolutely true in every way so of course in our doctrine of the word of god you know we our focus will be more on the written word of god the bible so we will be talking about the bible today and also in our next class now there's a term that is used in um in our christian circles for the bible we call it the canon now some of you may be familiar with this word but then for some of you it may be a new word c a n o n the word canon is used for the bible um this is actually derived from a hebrew word kane you know which um talks about a measuring rod if you were to look in ezekiel chapter 40 verse 3 i mean we will not be reading out that verse but if you were to look at ezekiel 40 verse 3 it talks about a measuring rod over there and that measuring rod is called a kane and from that hebrew term this word canon has been derived so a canon is something like a measure a measurement a standard um if you were using a ruler you know or a scale with measurements on it 
you and you're trying to measure a, let us say a table so you 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 take that uh, you know measuring tape or the ruler and you measure the table and you get to know what is the measure of that table how wide is it how long is it so you get an assessment of the measure the standard to which that particular table is being held using that measuring tape in the same way um, you know different kinds of cannons different kinds of measuring measures are used to measure different objects for instance weighing scales are used to measure uh, let us say you know if you if you you go to a store and you want to buy a uh, Uh, flour or sugar and uh, so the shopkeeper will place your packet of sugar or your packet of flour on the weighing scales and he is taking a measure of that so that he can show you exactly how much quantity there is in that packet now if one packet has got less quantity and the other packet has got a greater quantity you will know to what extent each of those two packets are reaching the standard are reaching the measure you know uh, which has been set so in that way this uh, term canon is a measure it's a standard now why is the bible being called a canon the reason that we call the bible a canon is because it is laying a standard it is laying a measure against which all humans are going to be measured one day when we stand before the judgment throne of god how is he going to judge us you know based on his feelings on that day based on uh, whom he likes and whom he dislikes no there'll be one measuring rod used to measure all humans on that day everyone is going to be measured against this canon of the bible to what extent did people humans line up with what this um, canon you know has set for them to what extent have they followed it to what extent have they ignored it to what extent have they believed in it and lived their life according to it so this canon this bible this written word of god becomes the measuring rod against which every human being is going to be measured okay so that is why the bible the scriptures are called the canon now um a lot of um, written literature has has existed right from the beginning of you know humanity all along from the time that people began to write they began to write down um uh, poetry they began to write down stories they maintained written records of their genealogies so written um written literature has always existed and so the israelites also as an educated community did a lot of writing in their days now after a lot of uh, written scrolls and a lot of written works started getting collected the people had to decide which particular writings are we going to regard as the word of god and which other writings are we going to just you uh, know dismiss as secular ordinary everyday writings so they had to differentiate between writings which would be regarded and labeled as god's word which means it's come from him it has to be uh, you know followed obeyed trusted believed in uh, you know so that would be that would have more value so certain write, uh, written materials would be labeled as written word of god and the rest would be just the words of humans which have been produced for you know just um, uh, human knowledge Uh, for for human entertainment probably and uh, so back then in those days how did the israelites decide which written works are going to be called canonical you know they're going to be the measure for, against which humans are going to be measured and which other writings are just going to be regarded as normal writings of humans you know um, which are going to just cater to other humans so how did the israelites differentiate between um canonical writings and normal everyday writings because they had a wide variety of writings um for instance you know if you were to uh, turn to numbers chapter 21 verses 13 to 15 
over there you have a description of the borders of the land being uh, described and then e even as they're talking about the different borders of that particular uh, territory it says in verse 14 it says that is why the book of the wars of the lord says and then it goes on to give a long description so over there in this numbers chapter 21 verses 13 to 15 you have mention being made about a book which is called book of the wars of the lord now these are wars which were fought in the name of the lord these are wars in which god helped the people to fight helped them to gain victory so this is something good this is something connected to god this is something connected to spiritual matters but do we find this book in the bible today you know if you were to flip through your bible pages will you find book of the wars of the lord you will find the book of genesis you'll definitely find the book of leviticus but will you find the book of the wars of the lord no so which means god told the israelites these particular writings you will regard them as my direct word to you and i will hold you accountable for these words and you have to follow them and abide by them the other things which you are writing down they are just writings they will not be regarded as my direct word to you uh, to humanity so there was a differentiation made right from the very beginning in in god labeling certain writings as his word and the rest would be just you know regarded as human writings just to you know look at some other examples of um, how god differentiated between writings if we were to look in joshua chapter 10 verse 13 you know where it, you have the incident uh, of the sun uh, standing still that's what is described over there in joshua 10 13. if we could have someone actually read out that joshua 10 verse 13. so the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies is this not written in the book of jashir so, so in the book of jashar uh this um event is mentioned but the book of jashar is not there in the bible on the other hand the book of joshua is found in the bible so even though book of jashar talked about the people entering the land and the people conquering and settling down and the book of joshua also talked about the same events god told the israelites to regard the book of joshua as sacred canonical scripture on the other hand the book of jashar was just a historical book which told about the history of israel and that is not found in the bible moving on to another example if we were to look in first kings chapter 4 verses 32 and 33 we see another uh, bible writer who produces some written works over there uh, first kings chapter 4 verses 32 and 33 if someone could read out he spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees from the Siddhar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. Here it talks about the, uh, the teachings of Solomon, which must have been you know, re recorded later on in written form. So Solomon actually did not just give the, uh, you know, the Proverbs which are mentioned in the book of Proverbs. It says over here that he actually produced 3,000 Proverbs. And then he, there are 1,005 songs which he composed. He also must have, you know, taught and written down about plant life. You know, that's, that would be biology, zoology. It says he talks about animals and reptiles and fish. These are all things which he wrote down. But they are just human writings. God told him that only the proverbs which he would, specific proverbs, you know, which he would give him, uh, they would become the book of proverbs. The rest would just be human writings. So only the book of proverbs was regarded as canonical scripture um, now in the same way you have so many other examples you have acts of solomon which is mentioned in first kings chapter 11 verse 41 you have the records of the kings of israel 
mentioned in 1 Kings 14, 19. In the same way, in 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 7, you have records of the kings of Judah being mentioned. So a lot of written works existed in the time of the Israelites. However, God selected only specific writings as his direct word of God. Okay, so um, we regard only those particular writings as canon, as the measurement against which we will all be measured one day. And these uh, canonical scriptures are regarded as the inspired word of God. He inspired those words. He caused the people to write down his thoughts in those particular canonical writings. Uh, so, um, you know, having looked at the general background, let's now come to the Old Testament canon. So you have the old, old canon, Old Testament canon, and you have the New Testament canon. Uh, how exactly was this Old Testament canon composed? How did it come into existence? How was it compiled? So um, now we know that the first five books uh, were written by Moses. Uh, we get to know that through so many verses, Exodus 17, 14, 24, 4, 34, 27, Numbers 33, 2, Deuteronomy 31, 22. All of these verses, they indicate to us that Moses was the author of the first five books. Um, Joshua, we get to know, wrote the book of Joshua because it says so in Joshua chapter 24, verse 26 where it says, Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. So we get to know that Joshua uh, was the author of the book of Joshua. In the same way, uh, we also see other prophets writing many different uh, uh, books. Samuel, for instance, um, we get to know that he wrote down the rights and duties of the king uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25. So based on that, we know that he was asked by God to write down certain things. Uh, for 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 22, talks about how the acts of Uzziah were written down by Isaiah the prophet. Uh, so um, there are many verses which talk about how Isaiah wrote down different records of different people. Uh, so we know that Isaiah was one of the composers uh, who composed some of the, uh, you know, um, canonical scripture. In the same way, you also have Jeremiah 30 verse 2, uh, where the Lord directly says to uh, Jeremiah, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. So uh, that became the, uh, the um, you know, that, that became Jeremiah. So we know all of these work, canonical works, because God says that he commanded that the people should write down those particular words. So in this way, different prophets were asked by God to write down different um, uh, writings and record different events, record the commandments which God has given, and all those became the word of God to the people. Some of the last few writings of the Old Testament would be um, after the exile, you know, Ezra comes back to Jerusalem in 458 BC, Nehemiah comes back around 445 BC, and so the book of Ezra, the book of uh, Nehemiah are written down around that time. Uh, then you have the book of Esther, that was probably written um, during the time of Artaxerxes, because she was married to Zeres, and so Zeres, one of the, the Zeres, um, crown prince, uh, his son would be Arta Zeres, not Esther's son. Esther's son uh, probably, you know, didn't have any kind of political holding. Uh, but anyway, so uh, during the time of Arta Zeres is probably when the book of Esther would have been written down. Um, so these are like the last few books which were uh, directly, uh, you know, commanded by God to be written down. And you finally have Malachi, who was ministering around 430 BC. So uh, he would have written down the book of Malachi sometime during that time. And so it's generally accepted that 435 BC onwards, um, I mean, nothing else was written. So Malachi would have been the last 
book which was directly given by god he asked a prophet to write down his words and after that uh, it is generally believed that the writings which came after 435 bc were no longer words from god they were no longer no no longer divinely inspired words they were just you know normal writings because people continued to write even after that but these were not writings which were given by god directly to the people for instance 200 bc onwards you have a lot of books written you have the book of tobit the book of judith the book of sirach you know these are all things which are part of the apocryphal books um so up to the time of malachi god spoke to certain prophets who had been very clearly proved and established as god's prophets because whatever they prophesied came true the things which they spoke actually happened and this was proof that they were directly from god they had heard from god and they had written down what god had commanded so their writings were regarded as inspired scripture but after the time of malachi just as god had warned that he would stop speaking to his people you know he said a day will come when you will long to hear my words but you will no longer hear them because you have chosen not you know to harden your hearts and not uh, hear from me so therefore after the time of malachi god stopped sending prophets who would speak to people directly from him so whatever writings came after the time of malachi those were all just writings of godly people who just wanted to write down godly things but these are not words which have been given directly by god to them to be conveyed to humans so uh, you have this book of tobit and book of judith and sirach and uh, all, you know all these other books which were composed after that and the jewish people of that time read these books accepted these books but they never labeled these books as canonical scripture they ju they just simply respected them as books from which maybe you can gain something learn something but they never gave them the label of canonical scripture uh in the same way today we have so many christian books i mean we have thousands upon thousands of books available and many of them have been written by very godly people who have uh, you know taught such beautiful things to us in their books but we don't regard any of those books as canonical scripture they are not god's direct message to humanity they are just the thoughts and ideas of people who want to help other people grow in god and so those books have been written but we don't regard any of we don't regard billy graham's books as uh, you know canonical scripture we have much respect for billy graham we learn a lot from his books people have been saved through his books but we don't regard those books as canonical scripture so in the same way you know all those books which were written back then 200 bc onwards they were good books there was godly learning to be you know found in those books but none of them were really inspired scripture and um these people from 200 bc onwards not only did they write many books some of them also tried to add to the canonical scriptures which had already been established to give some examples the book of esther was inspired by god god asked that that particular story should be written down in a particular way but then people who, uh, who came later on 200 after 200 bc they added some extra wording to the book of esther um so if you were to look at the you know uh, uh, the catholic version of um, the book of esther you would find some extra verses over there which are not found in our protestant bible and that is because we we, we don't include those particular extra portions in our a uh, protestant bible simply because those writings came much later they came after uh, you know this um, 435 bc so anything that was written after 435 bc we do not accept it as inspired scripture because by then the prophets of god had stopped god had no was no longer sending 
prophets who would write down his words and so um in the book of uh, in the in the apocryphal you know that the term apocrypha came to be used for these extra writings okay so uh, when you are uh, reading about christian history sometimes you will come across that term a p o c r y p h a apocrypha that's basically what these extra writings are called so in the apocryphal version of the book of esther it talks about uh, it it gives a long prayer which she is supposed to have prayed to god okay but it may be true it may not be true because we do not know how uh, authentic and correct that prayer is uh, because it was added much later to the original book of esther um so it talks about how she this there was this long prayer which she supposed to have prayed to god before going to the king and the story also says that once when she went to the king she fainted over there now we don't really know whether she did that or not because when when she goes to the king she goes you know with faith in god so she probably did not faint uh, so these are extra things which were added later in the same way in the book of daniel also um much later after 200 bc people added some extra things to the book of daniel uh, for instance in the book of daniel there's a prayer of abednego the prayer which abednego is supposed to have prayed while he was standing inside the you know the inside the fiery furnace if you remember uh, you know dan uh, daniel's three friends they were put into the fire uh, and then god spared their lives so this this suppose this is additional writing which is there in the apocryphal version of daniel where it gives a prayer of abednego uh, which he supposed to have prayed from inside the fiery furnace so again we do not know whether this is authentic or not because this was written much later so uh, these apocryphal writings uh, um some of them are i mean you would find them in the catholic version of the bible uh, so they include the first and second esdras and tobit and judith and um, there's something called wisdom of solomon also which is an apo apocryphal writing Uh, so you have all of these now uh, why does the catholic bible include these uh, books now what happened was that um, you know the hebrew scrolls were all written in the hebrew language so up to uh, you know the, the 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 time of malachi all of these uh, inspired scriptures were written in the hebrew language and of course some portions were written in aramaic we talked about that when we were covering the old testament so you know we'll not get into those details but yeah so the hebrew uh, bible was mainly written in hebrew some portions were written in the aramaic language and then um later on you know um, around um, 250 bc around uh, no sorry uh, around 150 bc 100 bc you know people were no longer very familiar with the hebrew language because now they were living in a greek culture and greek is what was being spoken by everyone so many of the uh, jewish people no longer knew how to read the hebrew words they were no longer familiar with the language and so at that time godly people decided it's it's time that we translated the hebrew scrolls into the greek language so that our people can continue to read the word of god and they can continue to follow the lord and honor him and so um, we have the septuagint being um, you know created so the septuagint when we when we did our old testament we talked about it septuagint is the greek translation of the hebrew scriptures so when the translation was done uh, of the hebrew scriptures into the greek language when they were doing the translation work not only did they translate the canonical scriptures they also translated these extra things which had been written more recently like this book of tobit and the first and second esdras you know they started including they, they they translated even these things and so if you were to look at a copy of the septuagint the septuagint will not only have your canonical scriptures your old testament over there it will also have these extra books sitting over there so um over time people began to read even these other books 
and many of them accidentally began to think that even these extra things are also inspired by god which is actually not correct um and uh, so uh, by the time we come to 100 bc that would be around the time when the maccabeans uh, you know had their revolt um of course by now you know israel had completely lost its freedom i mean they were under foreign rule you had uh, the syrians coming and conquering then uh, later on you have the greeks coming and conquering so now they are under you know um, under pagan rulers they are no longer a free nation all of this is going on so during the time of the maccabeans the maccabeans try to revolt against the foreigners they they want to fight a war against them you know drive them out of the country you know redeem their country once again so that they can be an independent nation once more so during this time during the time of the maccabeans um they all the things which they did for their freedom fight you know all those things are recorded uh, so even the maccabee uh, first and second maccabees is also one of the apocryph apoc apocryphal books which was composed which gives a history of the wars which these maccabees fought the revolt which they you know uh, started to drive out the the enemy all of that is uh, recorded um so in this uh, maccabean uh, during this during the time of this maccabees they themselves admit and this is what they write you know if you were to look in first maccabees chapter 9 verse 27 and also in first maccabees chapter 14 verse 41 it's very clearly written over there. They say, you know, um, that we are going through a time of great distress right now. And our hope, uh, our hope is that uh, the prophets who have ceased to appear will once again come back to us one day. Okay, so the exact wording is this. It says, um, such as, okay, we are going through a great distress such as, has not been since the time that prophets ceased to appear among them. So um, that's the actual wording which is used over there. Uh, basically, that it's basically saying over there, the prophets of God have ceased. They no longer are there. So they themselves admit that the prophets of God had stopped existing by that time. So whatever writings have been written during that time, they are not inspired scripture. They have not been written by the prophets of God. They've just been written by people who have been fighting for their freedom. Okay, so um, Josephus, you know, we know, we, we are kind of familiar with that name now. He was a historian who was there around 37 AD. Okay, so Josephus, he writes, this is what he writes in, in, in his historical work. He says, from, Atta, from the time of Artazeres, to our own times, a complete history has been written, but has not been deemed worthy of equal credit with the earlier records. So he says, we have continued to write down a, a detailed historical record of all that has been happening to our nation, to the, to the people of Israel. But we accept the fact that this is the, these writings do not have the same value as the earlier records of the prophets. So Josephus, from those days, he clearly himself, he says, these particular, these extra writings, they are not canonical. So this is, um, uh, and then the, the rabbis of that time, you know, the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish teachers of that time, in their writings, they also have written down and they have said that after the latter prophets, Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi had died, the Holy Spirit departed from Israel. So that is what they write in their writings. So they also admit and accept that things which were written after 435 BC onwards are not inspired scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, in the same way, you have the Qumran community. In their writings, they, they write down and they say that, uh, the, that they are waiting for the prophets to come back to their land. Um, then you have other Jewish literature, Baruch, and then the, uh, the Book of Prayer. 
in those writings also it is clearly mentioned that the time of the prophets is over so based on all of these written records of people who are clearly saying that the time of the prophets is finished we can accept that these books which were written after the time of the prophets are not canonical which is why when you finally come to the time of jesus christ and the time of the new testament writers they in all the quotations old testament quotations which they give they never ever mention even one single quotation from the apocryphal books you know jesus so many times he quotes from the old testament but none of jesus quotations are from the apocryphal writings in the same with the new testament writers they refer back to so many old testament scriptures but none of them mention any not even one sentence from any of the apocryphal books so by the time of jesus all the jews knew which is canonical scripture and which is not canonical scripture the only confusion which came up was because of the septuagint translation because when they did the translation they translated the canonical scriptures and they also translated the extra books and attached them so that led to a lot of confusion but the people of jesus times clearly knew which is canonical and which is not canonical and so when the in the time of the early church uh, you know in 170 ad one of the a very important leader of the early church a person named melito who was uh, you know at that time the leader of sardis the bishop of sardis um he he composed a list of um books and he said these books alone are now declared as canonical scripture this is the earliest written list that we have you know uh, so the earliest list in which it is clearly said these are canonical scriptures that list is from i mean we have that writing with us uh, today it's available a copy of that list of the original you know written in in the hands of uh, written literally by the hand of melito is there that document is there it ex it exists even today and so that's the earliest list which we have from 170 ad and in that he very clearly writes down these are the canonical scriptures and he mentions all the books of the old testament in his list he does not mention any of the apocryphal books those are not mentioned in uh, so by 170 ad everyone very clearly knew which are the canonical scriptures and which are not canonical scriptures why are we stressing upon this so much because later the catholic church it declared and said oh these other uh, books they are also canonical that declaration was made a long time later after a lot of people had already clearly established that there's a distinction between the canonical books and the other extra books so you can't have some you know somebody coming down centuries later and then declaring oh this is canonical because after it has been established by so many centuries of leaders and the jewish people that certain things are canonical and certain things are not canonical you can't just suddenly have a governing body come and declare oh you know these things are also canonical it does not um you know there's no authenticity in what they are saying so it is important for us to know these things um so uh, we we are familiar with this uh, person named jerome right uh, he is the one who translated the bible uh, into the latin language because by then even greek was going out of fashion most of the people did not know greek anymore they all were talking latin so then uh, you know uh, the the pope at that time Uh, the catholic church had already been formed by that time and um, so the pope he instructed jerome to translate the greek bible into um, into the latin language so jerome started doing the translation work he used the greek septuagint you know so the old testament he began to translate it from the septuagint as for the new testament it's anyway written in greek language so he was translating from there into latin so he used the septuagint and the uh, greek new testament to do his translation latin translation uh, so that a latin bible can be brought out when he started doing his translation work he suddenly realized that in the septuagint you know the greek translation 
certain Old Testament verses have been changed because when he started comparing the Hebrew script, scrolls and the Septuagint, he noticed that the Septuagint is sometimes it changes the sentences, it changes the wording. And so he decided, I'm not going to use the Septuagint to translate the Old Testament. I'll directly go to the Hebrew scrolls. And from there, I will do my actual translation because he wanted the Latin Bible to be accurate. So he took that effort of doing his uh, Latin translation from the original Hebrew scrolls and not from the Septuagint. So he, in fact, was reluctant to add the extra books which are there in the Septuagint. But the Pope ordered him and said, you have to translate even those and include them in the Latin Bible. So the, uh, the Latin Bible is called the Latin Vulgate. That's the term that is used for the Latin translation, which was done by Jerome. So because Jerome had been ordered by the authorities to translate not only the Old Testament canonical books, but even the extra ones, he did the translation, but he declared and wrote, you know, in his writings, he wrote and said, even though I have done translation of both of them, he said, the canonical scriptures will be called the books of the canon. As for the other extra books that I have translated, I'm just going to call them books of the church. They are going to help the church, maybe to learn some extra things and benefit, but they are just books of the church. So he gives them the term, um, or something, this is a technical Latin word which he uses. So he does not regard the extra books as books of, um, as canonical books. All right. So Jerome clearly differentiates between the two categories. But the Catholic Church continued to, you know, retain these books in their Catholic uh, version of the Bible. And then in the time of Martin Luther is when you know the Protestant, um, the Protestant protesting was done, where Martin Luther and the people who wanted to hold on to the true scriptures protested against the Catholic Church and all the wrong teachings which the Catholic Church had started bringing in. And uh, so Martin Luther, who led this Protestant movement, of protesting against the wrong things which the Catholic Church is teaching. Um, uh, when that Protestant movement started, um, and uh, after the movement started, he brought out a German uh, Bible. So he did translation of the Bible into German. So at that time, he very, very clearly established and he said, these apocryphal books, they are not going to be there in the German Protestant Bible because they are extra writings. So, uh, okay, now it's break time, but we will continue looking at this so that we'll have a clear picture of, you know, what the Old Testament canon should include. So we'll meet again at 11 o'clock. Thank you.